Good afternoon. I'm Robert Baylor, Director of Communications at NUCA. We're facing a very tough environment today because of the suddenness of this coronavirus pandemic, and we're all having to adapt to circumstances that are largely beyond our control. But we face crises every day in our work. None are as large as this one, but we learn and adapt, as this nation has done many times before when we have faced a collective challenge. Information will play a large part in overcoming this challenge. If you haven't already seen it, NUCA is providing a one-stop webpage listing government resources on safety and health, regulatory changes, OSHA workplace health and safety information, and many other workplace topics. Our webpage can be found at nuca.com slash panflu, P-A-N-F-L-U, or you can go to the nuca.com homepage for the link. We update the pandemic flu pages every day with new information, so please check back often. I've also collected as many third-party resources as I've discovered have been sent to me by our NUCA chapters, including analyses on the new Paid Leave Act by legal firms, information on insurance and accounting advice from noted firms around the nation, and everything else we could think of that would be useful to a utility construction business owner in taking those first steps towards recovery. You can take one of those first steps forward today with today's NUCA Webinar Wednesday presentation. Some housekeeping details before we start. Everyone has been placed on mute, but we can submit written questions at any time to our presenter via the chat feature on WebEx. We'll be taking questions at the end of this presentation. Please submit your written questions to me at any time during this presentation via the chat feature at the bottom of your web WebEx screen. The chat feature looks a little like a voice balloon. I will pick as many as I can for our presenter to answer. Today's webinar is entitled Coronavirus, an Unforeseeable Circumstance. Does your contract protect you under force majeure clauses? Entire sections of the nation have been placed into quarantine, keeping millions of employees at home to save them from the risk of illness or worse. In the construction industry, force majeure clauses in contracts are taking center stage. These force majeure clauses allocate risks and usually come into play as a result of weather-related events, labor strikes, or natural disasters. With greater anxiety over the potential economic impact of the 2020 coronavirus pandemic, force majeure provisions as well as notice and suspension rights are getting a second look. On this webinar, our expert will discuss what these clauses mean in contracts and what business owners can do with provisions relating to delay. Our presenter today is Sean R. Farrell. He is a partner at the law firm of Cohen Segelius in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For more than 20 years, Sean has represented general contractors, construction managers, owners and developers, and subcontractors in construction-related litigation. His areas of practice are construction and labor and employment. He is licensed to practice law in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Sean is also the general counsel for Nuka of New Jersey and a member of several construction associations. Sean, I turn the webinar over to you. Listen, it's a popular topic, I think, uh, shown by the uh, number of people that are trying to participate today. So apologize for any technical difficulties. Obviously, you know, these things happen in our day and age. And when everyone's on the Internet at the same time, it makes it even more difficult. So anyway... Uh, what I wanted to tell you was the goal of this presentation is really to impart to you some knowledge and information that will keep you out of litigation. Uh, I've spent my 25 years of practice litigating these types of cases. If you go on my website, you'll see a list of some of the cases that I've won recently. But the most important cases to me, the ones that I like the most, are the ones that you never hear of and never see because we're able to resolve things without getting to litigation. And that's the underlying theme here that I want to impart to you guys and answer any questions that you might have concerning your contractual rights around this shutdown in, in construction. I mean, right now, Pennsylvania has issued, their governor has issued uh, a stop work notice for construction. So you're not working at all. That's not true in New Jersey or with some of the agencies like the Port Authority and the MTA in New York. But everyone is going through different uh, circumstances here. And even if your business isn't being shut down by governors, certainly your workforce might be impacted by the lack of skilled workers. And, and what do we do to that? So if you go to the next slide, Zach, there you'll see me. Uh, let's flip to the next slide. And what I want to just jump into here is what do we really mean by force majeure, right? This is a very old concept. Uh, it's a French word, but every country is history dating back to the Roman times on it. And it, what it means is some superior force is taking over your contract. You don't have the means and methods available to you to do the work as you would normally do. And historically, 
contracts have always been understood to be an obligation to perform, but that obligation ends when it's impossible to perform. And that's what force majeure literally means. It means that it's impossible to form to perform your contract. You can't do anything about it. There's a change and an unavoidable accident, an extraordinary event. If we flip to the next slide, Zach, here we're going to talk about the elements to satisfy force majeure in modern times, okay? And there it's pretty much the same definition. Courts have stayed with that general theme that it's an event beyond the control of the contracting parties. Now, that's a very important element right there, beyond your control. Anything that's in your skill set or anything that you can anticipate that's happening, that's not beyond your control. That's something that you can contractually shift the risk to other people on or accept the risk that's being put onto you. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about events that you can't control and that cannot be anticipated. If you can anticipate this risk, if I don't, you know, I'm, I'm licensed in three states, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. But in the Midwest, if there's tornadoes happening in a certain period of time, there are cases that would suggest that that's not an anticipated risk, that you know during certain months there's going to be tornadoes, just like on construction projects where in my jurisdictions, you know in certain jobs there's going to be lack of design, maybe comebacks that you're going to have to do. Those are not unanticipated risks. The coronavirus is an unanticipated risk, and I don't think in our current environment that many people would disagree with that. Uh, the risk must be unavoidable, and the parties to the contract can't be in part or solely the cause of the event. Now, let me give you a real-world situation that I had a few years ago in Philadelphia where we were building – my general contractor was building a condominium high-rise, and he had – precast walls that he was purchasing from a producer in the middle of the country. Well, this precast concrete producer, vendor, had a fire at his plant, burned down the entire plant. Therefore, he could not get the precast walls that he needed to enclose the building, and it caused massive delays on the project. There, court found that was not force majeure. That was not an act of God. Even though the fire was an accident, there was no you know, indications that anything was done intentional, there the general contractor had selected that vendor. He could have selected other vendors, and therefore the court found that he had participated in that decision that led to this unfortunate circumstance that impacted the schedule. So I want you to understand that and use that as a paradigm when we're talking about these force majeure measures, uh, how different this is and how you want to structure your letters differently. Because what I want you to be able to do here is take the information that we're talking about today and have a practical application for that immediately on your projects. So if we go to the next slide, you should be seeing what are some events that are force majeure, war, riots, earthquake, floods, and the coronavirus. These things are all outside of your control. You can't know when a war is going to start, stop, riot, earthquake, or the coronavirus. This is something completely unanticipated, but can impact not only your ability to get on a job if a governor is issuing an order to stop all work, but could issue, you know, affect your workflow and your men. So one of the things to think about so that we can take a practical approach to this are what are some of the remedies for force majeure? And if we go to the next slide, we're going to see the remedies are extra time, extra money, money for labor, material, equipment, home office overhead. So these are some of the things that we have to think about. Also, in a force majeure situation, we may be able to terminate the contract after a period of time as opposed to waiting in limbo forever, and then when other projects are opening up, this project may open up at the same time, and you won't have the coronavirus, hopefully in the future, uh, as an impediment to your workforce. But what will be an impediment to your workforce is now you might have taken on more projects than you can handle. 
either from a management side or a labor side, and that can have impact. So we have to think about what these remedies are and how we want to deal and protect the company currently in this situation right now. If we go to the next slide, I want to talk to you a bit about what it doesn't mean. It's not a mistake by a party. Uh, if you, at bid time, use your skill and judgment to anticipate material buyouts or a favorable schedule or you didn't factor in uh, coordination issues with other subcontractors, if you're a subcontractor, these are not the issues that a force majeure clause will deal with. And the mere present of, presence of a risk or uncertainty is not going to be related to force majeure, right? So, for instance, if you were out there and uh, you called in for a mark out and they came out and they mismarked where the utility line might be running underneath, none of that is force majeure. None of these clauses relate to those specific problems. Let me address, if I could, a situation where you're looking at your contract, you're trying to find the force majeure clause, and it's not in there. Because it doesn't have to be in all contracts. It's a standard provision. It's typically in most contract provisions, but it's not in all of them. So what do you do if you don't have a force majeure clause? If you still have the coronavirus, what are we gonna do then? And if we go to the next slide, in that situation, we're going to rely upon a legal theory of impossibility of performance. And as you can tell from that legal theory's name, it's sort of similar to the elements of force majeure. It's where you can't perform the contract because it's outside of your control. If I was a uh, contractor who was going to remodel your kitchen, uh, and before I showed up on the job, the house burnt down, well, how can I remodel the kitchen if the house is burnt down? right? It's impossible. And what we look at for impossibility of performance are similar elements to force majeure. But here's a very important distinction. If it's in a contract term, meaning we define what is or isn't an event that we're going to recognize, we get additional time and money for potentially. If it's not in that contract term, then we're leaving it to the discretion of a court, and courts don't always view the world the way that you might view a world. I've had more than one judge tell me, as we sat in chambers, maybe on, when we're at a pretrial conference, that you know if this was a personal injury case or this was a different type of case, it's usually the area of law that they practice before they got on the bench. They would know the value of the case and help settle the case, but they just don't understand construction. And that's a problem, because now if we are relying upon the theory of impossibility of performance, we're leaving it to that judge who might not know your industry to talk about foreseeability. They may think, and I'll be a little bit hyperbolic here, they may think under foreseeability, meaning it can't be foreseeable, the event, that people getting sick is a normal occurrence in business. So how many people got sick at your company might be a question that a judge would ask you if we were going under the legal theory of impossibility of performance. Instead of saying I had a, uh, a force majeure event, I had a flood, a fire, I had the coronavirus, it's listed in my contract as a recognized agreement between the parties, a meeting between the minds. Instead of having that, now I have to hear, we have to deal with the speculation of a judge to say, well, sure, in, in the world in general, people are getting sick, but you specifically, how many of your employees were sick? And that's a worse position to be in, because even if your people aren't sick, they might not be showing up to work. And even if they show up to work, they might not be working as efficiently as they otherwise would. So these are all the things we want to take away that discretion of the judge. Another element that a judge will look at under this theory is severity. How bad was the disruption? How bad was the delay? Well, that is 
a very difficult issue to answer. I mean, think about your own jobs. If you're submitting, if you're getting, uh, providing submittals at the beginning of the job so that you can go out and procure whatever material you need to install and that submittal process is delayed, it's not a day-for-day -day delay on the back end of that. It can have an exponential effect on the schedule. But now to have a judge sit there and say, well, what's the severity of your delay? Or worse, you're in a jurisdiction like New York where you can have typically delays to the start of projects for years. That happens all the time in the agencies in New York where you get awarded a job, you sign the contract, and they say, wait. And then a year, two years later, they say, okay, we're ready for you now. Come back in and do your work. Well, if you're in that scenario, you're in that geographical region, what's the delay impact? Is it really severe? Now you're leaving it up to the discretion of a judge to say whether or not it is or isn't. And we don't want to be there. That's why it's very important that we get this into our contracts specifically for the fears and the, and the worries that we want to address. Uh, while I also want it into a contract as opposed to being relied upon by this theory of impossibility, it's going to limit the disputes between the parties. If you're having this dialogue in the beginning of your job when you're contracting and everyone understands what is a force majeure event, then there's not going to be the need for anybody to run into court because they're going to understand their contract. So the more clear we are with these clauses, the better protected we'll be and the less we'll be in a situation where you're calling a lawyer or worrying about getting into court and convincing a judge of what you know to be true. So we go to the next slide, Zach. What should the force majeure clause consider? Obviously, the first one is specific events that constitute a force majeure. What are you worried about? Obviously, now we're thinking about pandemics. We're thinking about coronavirus. We should have that in our clauses if they're not. This is a great opportunity to go back, look at the clauses in your contracts that you've signed, and do they say with enough specificity this type of event? If they don't mention anything by the World Health Organization, WHO, they don't say the words pandemic or word viruses, flus, things of that nature, we need to include that in there. Because, I mean, I, I was just watching the news the other day in China that has now kind of knocked down all the hospitals they built and people are starting to feel better. Now they're worried about a second round because as they open up travel, they're worried about reinfection. So for the context that we're looking at, we can't assume that this coronavirus is not going to come back and impact us in the near future. So we've got to draft our contracts accordingly. Uh, who's allowed to invoke the clause? Can the contractor just do it directly or the subcontractor? We can put in the provisions that if this event happens, I don't have to ask you for a change order. I'm automatically going to get time time and money, whatever the impact is, however we want to structure the agreement. So that's very significant. We can put the remedy right into the clause, and we should think about that and try to negotiate that. The time period for suspension of work. So how long does the delay have to happen before you can say, I'm moving on to the next project? I need to, I need to get to the next job so I can actually start working so I can actually start making some money, as opposed to worrying that you can't completely fill up your capacity because you have this lingering job and you don't know when it's going to start and when it's really going to be fully uh, opened up and you have a notice to proceed. So these are issues that we can address right in there. Uh, can the suspension of work become a termination of the work? That's kind of coupled within there. Also coupled within there is late starts, right? Do we want to be sitting around, forget about the jobs that we're in, and now we're impacted on those jobs, but what happens when we're, on a, we're awarded a job or we're looking at a job and it never starts? We can address that right in here as well, that if it's because of these force majeure events that after a period of time you get to walk away, or after a period of time you get to bill for the overhead that you're otherwise missing. So 
with that understanding that these terms, whatever your risk tolerance is for each one of these lists of, uh, of, of things that we should be thinking about, we should incorporate it into the clause. So if we go to the next slide, Zach, you're going to see example one. And this is a, an example of a contract clause that tries to deal with a force majeure event specifically tied to cost, okay? It says, if there's an increase in the actual cost of the labor or materials charged to the contractor because of an event listed above as force majeure in excess of 5% to the making of this agreement, the price set forth in the agreement shall be increased without the need for a written change order, shall be increased. So now, if the event happens, you know what's going to happen. Now, these are just suggested terms. Everything's negotiable in excess of 5%. That might not make sense for you. That might be a point of negotiation. Maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 15%, maybe it's 20%. Whatever you can do to limit the risk, even if it doesn't eliminate the risk, is a better contract clause than you might have right now. And you should compare what you're currently dealing with with respect to some of these provisions. But I don't want to stop the discussion right there. If you got this provision in your contract and you thought, wow, this is a great provision, in excess of 5% is what I need, and it's not subject to, you know, written change order, I know I'm going to get more money, that doesn't end the discussion for you guys as a team, right, your construction team from your estimators to your project management team, you're going to have to someday establish that the cost went up. So you're going to have to hold on to your bids, your estimates, your working papers, your proposals. You're going to have to be able to document that now my suppliers, I had locked them into a certain price, and now they're charging me an additional price, or that the labor went up, uh, that, you know, many of you might have collective bargaining agreements for those of you that are union. It's pretty straightforward on that one uh, as, as to, you know, every – May of the year that the wages are going to increase, so you, you can use that as a means to doing the labor. But don't forget, just because you have a nice contract provision, even if it's what exactly what you wanted, you've got to think on the project level, the contract administration level, when the project is moving, how do I document, how do I preserve that documentation so I can present it to the owner of the general contractor that I have a contract with, stay out of a fight, stay out of litigation, but get that change order approved, and that's how you do it. The start is with the contract. The second element is documentation. Zach, if we move to the uh, next slide, I'll give you another example of a different type of force majeure clause. Here we've got the coronavirus specifically tied in as a force majeure event and cost, right? So there we've got the price the contract price for this construction project has been calculated based on the current prices for the component building material. You can put any description that you want in there. If you're a steel fabricator, you can put it in, coder, whatever you want to describe. Uh, if you're doing you know, heavy highway, it doesn't have to be building material. However, the market for building material may become volatile, and suddenly price increases occur as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. So here I'm tying it directly to that, okay? But again, you're going to have to prove this out. Now, I won't read the entire paragraph here, but the, the last uh, sentence there that says the contract sum, time of completion, con or contract requirements affected by the coronavirus outbreak shall be equitably adjusted by change order in accordance with the procedures of the contract documents. So there, it's not automatic. There, you're going to follow the change order procedures within your contract. That might be a fallback provision from above. If you're negotiating with somebody and they say it can't be automatic, that doesn't make sense. I'm not automatically going to give you an increase in the price of your contract. This is a nice fallback provision. Again, it's tying it in specifically to coronavirus, but it's saying you're going to get an equitable adjustment, adjustment because of that. And you're going to follow provisions of your contract or dispute resolution provisions of your contract. So there are two examples that you can take with you right now and get 
it into your contract and start negotiating with your contract. But that leads to a question that I'm sure many of you are thinking. I have a lot of contracts already. They're already signed. I can't go back and change them. What am I going to do? Zach, if we can go to the next slide. The first thing you could do is have that language reviewed by an expert, a lawyer who does construction law. Everyone should have a lawyer. Uh, first and foremost, by the way, my, my usual uh, advice to everyone is the most important thing you can have is probably an accountant and or followed by uh, a good surety uh, insurance broker, bonding broker, and then third is a good lawyer. Because we chase money. Those guys can make you money every day. Uh, that aside, this is the time to turn to that expert and have them review your language specifically. Because as you can see in just the examples that we use, there are, are nuances that they're going to be able to understand. So I put away for a rainy day. Today it's raining. We've got the coronavirus. We've got to get out there. We've got to have these contracts reviewed. We've got to know what the risk is. And then what I urge everyone on the phone to do is once we understand the parameters that we have as a contract, what our obligations are, and what the fail-safes are, then we start to follow that second bullet where we craft communications regarding the project through email or calls around those elements of force majeure. And if we don't have a force majeure clause, let's say we're just working on purchase orders or something of the like, or our contract just doesn't have one, then we've got to have these communications start framing around the impossibility of performance paradigm. Why? Because again, if this gets to a worst case scenario and we're in front of a judge or a group of arbitrators who are gonna to try to decide the language, that type of contemporaneous documentation of what's being understood will be used as evidence as to what the meaning of the minds between the parties are. So if you're saying, hey, I don't have a contract, but we all know that coronavirus is a force majeure event, and I'm immediately entitled to time and money, and no one is objecting on the other side of that conversation, that in, in legal parlance is, silent, is admission by silence. So an example of that would be if you got into a car accident, and a passenger by immediately approached you when you're in the car and said, oh, my God, I think you're drunk. Any normal person would say, no, I'm not. You're crazy. I'm not. If that person is silent to that issue, even without a blood alcohol test, that can be used as evidence that they were. And the same applies in contracts and construction. So when you're in meetings and you're saying these things and people are responding and they're nodding their heads, yes, follow it up with an email. Hey, as we talked about, and you agreed. Now, conversely, if it's a subcontractor to you and they're doing the same thing, you've got to articulate your position. You've got to be an advocate for the company, and you've got to say, I don't agree with that. We don't have a contract provision. No one ever said that. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. And make sure that that's documented. That way, it won't get used against you the way that you could use it as a sword if you needed it. The final thing that we must know about contracts that have already been signed is the last bullet point on that page, which is notice provisions. Just because you have a well-written contract, one that has all the bells and whistles of a force majeure clause, doesn't mean that the contract doesn't have other provisions. And the notice provision is an important one that ties directly to these acts of God, meaning that you have to tell the other party you're being impacted. You can't assume that they know. It's pretty obvious. I think most people would say it's pretty obvious that the world is going through a pandemic and that people are being laid off, unemployment's up. How could no one know? doesn't matter. You've got to follow your contract and these notice provisions. There's a case out of North Dakota, I believe, that's directly on point. It's a federal case, and most jurisdictions follow that in, in the federal court circuit. That was exactly what I said. They had a great 
force majeure clause, but they never put anybody on notice. That can impact your rights no matter what your contract says. A couple of years ago, I had a, uh, had a FedEx project where I represented the site contractor who was bringing in an access road up to the north side of the building. And the boring laws and geotechnical reports showed, you know, silty sand, no problems. Well, he found granite like rock that cost him a ton to remove, uh, cost over a million dollars to remove. Now, this was clearly a different site condition, and he had a different site condition clause. It was a type one different site condition, and everybody knew it. What did they say? Notice, you didn't tell me that this was an issue. Now, they saw him out there. He was using dynamite to get rid of the rock. Everybody saw the, the volume and the effort that he was putting in to get this access road in. Their defense was, if you had told me earlier in the project, I could have put the access road on the south side of the building instead of the north side of the building. Now, fortunately for my client, that proved impossible because of the geographical layout of the building, and we were able to show that and resolve the matter. But that's how important notice provisions are. It's a good metaphor here because it, it's a contract term, different site condition, and a force majeure clause. You can have them perfectly worded so that you should win. If you, knew, if you lose that notice, if you don't do the notice, you're in trouble. So, Zach, if we move to the next slide, I provided you in this slide with a letter that you can immediately copy and send out the projects that you're on. I don't see a reason not to send it out because this is noticed. This one is noticed to a general contractor, but certainly you can, if you're a subcontractor, alter it uh, for that. And I think I even give you an example of that in a second. Um, but it's notice of potential delay. So it says, dear so-and-so, pursuant to section blank of our subcontract, now they're asking for you in your contract to put them on notice. I know a lot of people say, oh, isn't this gonna be litigious? This is gonna make it look like I'm looking for a fight. No, it's not because they are requiring you to have that in your subcontract. I had a, I had a contractor once, I was doing a seminar similar to this, not on coronavirus or force majeure, but on project management. And I was telling people about their notice provisions and he followed my advice. And then he calls me up one day and he says, they think I'm being litigious. I said, ask them for a $0 change order. And in this $0 change order, all it's going to say is all notice provisions in the contract are waived. And if they sign that, never talk to them again about your issues and your cost impacts and your claims. We can all do it at the end of the job, like gentlemen. Well, as you can imagine, no one ever signed that $0 change order. And he was happy and lucky that he had put them on notice. So that's what you've got to do. So this letter, if you jump down to about the middle of the page, it says, while subcontractor has not currently experienced any impact as the coronavirus health emergency continues to evolve. So what this is doing is saying, I'm putting you on notice. You will never be able to claim that I prejudiced you in any other way. From a legal definition of prejudice, that means that I was so late in telling you something that I cut off the options that you had. You had maybe three options, but by the time I told you about it, you had no options, or the only option was to have me work at a higher expense. So what we want to do is eliminate prejudice by giving this upfront notice. You should be doing it immediately. Zach, if we flip to the next slide, you'll see notice the general contractor of actual delay. Now, this is a worst case scenario. Now we're living through this virus. It doesn't end in the next week. It doesn't end by April 12th where President Trump says we're gonna open up the economy. It rolls on. Now you might be able to see more definitively the impacts that you're feeling. This is a letter you want. This is a letter you should be copying. Again, you're keeping it professional. You're identifying the contract term that requires you to put things on notice. And then you're telling them, hey, I'm impacted by these ways. And it says, as follows, colon, bullet, bullet, bullet. You gotta fill in the bullets. Where are you impacted? How are you impacted? How is it affecting you? Zach, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that this letter continues. 
that says, and this is an important provision, because a lot of contracts will say, the owner, more onerous ones will say, and some of the you know, uh, state agencies that you work with might say, you've not only got to tell me in a certain period of time, but you've got to tell me how much the impact is within a certain period of time. And I've had a lot of contractors as clients tell me, well, I didn't put them on notice because I couldn't calculate the damage because it wasn't over. That's not an excuse. Courts don't like that. You've got to put them on notice, and if you can't calculate the exact dollar impact, say that. And that's that second paragraph right there on that slide that you're seeing, that at this time it's impossible to notify you of the direct impact that the COVID-19 will have on the project cost and schedule. If you know, put it in there. If you can reasonably estimate it so that you're not, you know, shooting in the dark on a wag, a wild-ass guess, if you, could, if you know, put it in there, or if you can reasonably estimate, put it in there, but let them know it's an estimate. Tell them. This is what I think is running. It's running about this much month. I don't know how many months it's going to be. But put as much knowledge down as you can. And I recommend you send that letter off at least every 30 days. There's no reason not to. Fiction you happen to be working in, what uh, state you're working in, and whether or not you're working with state agencies, many of them require days anyway. So the squeaky wheel gets greased. You're putting them on notice. You're satisfying your elements. It's all very good. Uh, next slide, Zach. There you're going to see notice to the owner of potential delay. So for those people on the phone that are a general contractor and you have a, or a prime contractor, there's type of notice very similar to the notices that we've already looked at. But you want to get that out there as quickly as possible. Again, on the potential impacts, I see no reason to not get it out there. Your contract already requires it. If they call you up and say, why are you sending this? You said, well, your contract tells me to. That's why I'm doing it. If your contract didn't tell me to, I wouldn't. Um, let's go to the next slide, Zach. What are some of the things you should be thinking about either to include into those letters as costs or at least to be monitoring as we walk through this current time in our country. And here's a list of the things that I think you should be thinking about that would be impacted costs. The screen that you're looking at, insurance, bond costs, car travel expense, small tools, project photos, taxes, dumpsters, could be site safety issues, whatever those additional costs are. Zach, if you go to the next slide, to me, here on this slide, you're gonna see supervision costs. This is the large dollar value, right? So let's say you had a project that should be starting right now. You hire a uh, superintendent or a foreman who you wouldn't have otherwise hired, and now he's here. You can't let him go because you don't know how long the delay is going to be, but he's got nothing to do. You're still going to pay him. That's a cost directly related to the coronavirus. What is the cost? What is the monthly cost? You can put in a letter. Hey, I got a supervisor, senior project manager, a project manager, whomever. Or if you're getting up to the level of project executive, maybe they have other things to do, but some of their time, some of the overhead was supposed to be billed to this job so that you have enough to cover your own company overhead. These are real numbers that you could have captured, but you're not because you're impacted by the coronavirus. That should be included in the sample letters if it's a true statement. Include those types of costs, at least identify these types of costs if you can't quantify them. Here's how much is costing me a month for each one of these individuals. So those are some of the things that you should be thinking about in this environment. And in that way, you're gonna protect the company. Next slide, Zach. But is that all you need to do? If you did everything right, if your contract magically said the words coronavirus in them, which you can't, but if it did, and it was worded in the best way to protect you, and you sent out all the notices, and you quantified your damages, is that all? Is that enough? It's not. Next slide. 
there's a thing called a duty to mitigate. That means you have to take advantage of any opportunity you can to minimize the damages that are happening surrounding this force majeure. What can that be? I don't know what it is. Maybe the early notice is part of it. So if I'm putting them on early notice, I'm giving them an opportunity to redesign, terminate the job, terminate it for convenience, pay me for my work in place that I've done and move on. That's one. Or maybe if there are you know, contract provisions that allow you to get billed for material that you have stored, well, buy out all your material. Or maybe that's one of the dialogues that you're going to have with whomever you're working with is to say, do you want me to buy out my material? They may or may not. Uh, they may be in this current environment, I would think that they don't want to expend more money. But if they are optimistic that this is going to end soon and they're going to be able to move on with construction in, in an unimpacted way, maybe that's one way to mitigate the damages is at least you bought out the material now, you get the bill for it now, you get the bill for sewer material, and everyone is the better. Even if you don't finish the job, at least the material is there, you can get my bill of sale, and we can move on. So next slide, Zach. I'm coming up, I think, to my half hour, very close to it. I want to leave some time for questions, but that's the landscape of where we're currently at. We're in a uncharted territory. We've never had a pandemic like this in the 25 years that uh, I've been practicing or the 50 years that I've been alive. So this is new territory, but it's an old game. It starts with the contract. What does it say? If it doesn't say anything, then we fall back to general legal principles of equity, the doctrine of the possibility of performance, and now we know what we're playing with, but now comes the work on your part. I can't stress this enough. We've got to document the cost. We've got to send out the letters on notice, and we've got to look for opportunities to, again, document and have conversations around how do we lessen the impact of this for everyone, even if my contract allows me to stop working. And by doing that, you're going to be able to be in these meetings. You're going to be a productive team player, stakeholder, and we're going to close out these jobs without, not without impact, not without disruption, but without litigation. And that's, and that's one of the goals that I was having here today for everyone who's participating is to minimize this bad situation getting worse. So with that, I'm going to pause, I guess, and I don't know if anyone has emailed any potential questions uh, over to Bob and Luca, but if you have, maybe Bob can. Uh, Sean? We, Sean, we have a question. Yep. It is, can, a question, owner, okay. can, an enfor can an owner enforce a no damages for delay cost time only for force majeure? Does this mean no equitable adjustment? Yes, because in a no damage for delay clause, the relief is time. So while I don't subscribe to this, the courts do, and again, this is why we want to take everything out of the discretion of the courts. They believe if you had a year to perform work and you get impacted in the first six months, so I give you another six months to complete the work, that there's no impact there. And we all know that that's not true demobilization costs, there's a tremendous amount of costs that are going to be incurred by the contractor. But they are legally enforceable in the states that I practice in. I know we ha might have some people outside of New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. So, again, I'm limiting uh, my, my answer to those states. And within those states, some courts hold no damage for delay clauses more strictly interpreted, meaning tighter, more enforceable than others. New York being the worst, uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey being about equal. Uh, I think you get a little bit more leeway in New Jersey than Pennsylvania on the enforceability of them. But there are exceptions to a no damage for delay clause. That's what I want to tell the person with that question. Uh, it's outside the contemplation of the parties, this period of delay. That's one exception. Active owner interference. So now, Imagine, and I don't know who asked the question, if you're a subcontractor, but I'm going to put it in that paradigm so I can 
demonstrate this active GC or owner uh, interference. So if you're a subcontractor and the pandemic, this coronavirus is the issue, it's not the world and God has stopped me from working. It's general contractor, or if you're the general contractor owner, you have denied me access to my work. Now they're going to turn around and say, I couldn't give you access to the work because there is a stoppage because of the governor's office potentially. doesn't matter. Your contract isn't with the state. Your contract is with either the owner or the general contractor. And your position with that is going to be, you denied me access to the work, and therefore I can't work. And under that scenario, when we start framing it in that way, we can get around the no damage to delay clause. So the answer to your question is they're enforceable. The answer to your question is there are exceptions. I believe that this coronavirus and this pandemic falls into an exception, and you should be able to get compensation regardless of the no damage for delay clause. But one, we should look at the no damage for a delay clause, see how it's worded, figure out what state you're working in, and see how the courts have interpreted that contract language. But there are exceptions. You should know that to a no damage for delay clause, and that's where we want to frame all of this. And the letters, and the notice letters, you want to start to frame them into those exceptions so that you can get around that. Thank you, Sean, for a very enlightening presentation. A recording of this webinar will be made available to all registrants the next day or two and will be available on the NUCA.com website. And thank you for your support of NUCA. Please know we are there for you in, during this uncertain time and are working with many officials and private industry leaders to find the right path out of this national crisis for our members. Thank you for your time this afternoon, and please enjoy the rest of your week.